Good morning, everyone. It's Russ Barkley. I'm back again with another weekend research review on ADHD research. Uh, by the way, if you're seeing ads on some of the websites that I show, uh, I'm trying to use an ad blocker, but it doesn't seem to be working too well. So apologies about that. Hopefully it's not too distracting. Today, because the dad jokes are so brief, I'm going to give you several of them. So let's get started with those, and then we can have a look at our four research studies for this week. Your first dad joke is, I was complimented for my parking. Someone left a note saying, parking fine. <laughs> That's pretty corny, I think. I was charged $9 extra at a hotel for the air conditioner. It was seriously uncool. Yeah, I know. Pretty corny, too. It was wrong when people say that age is just a number. It's actually a word. <laughs> okay. Finally, my doctor just told me that I am slowly going deaf. That was hard for me to hear. <laughs> okay. I kind of like that one. That's pretty good, especially uh, that's an old man joke. All right. First up is going to be a, a brief article uh, that appeared actually in several popular media outlets on the web, which is why I'm going to talk about it. Otherwise, I wouldn't have paid much attention to it, and you're about to find out why. Uh, this is a study on the effects of tactile massage on adolescents with ADHD. It was conducted over in Sweden, and it is published in Complementary Therapies in Clinical Practice. Uh, the Swedish investigators took 14 teenagers and measured them at baseline with rating scales of their ADHD symptoms and other symptoms such as oppositional behavior, their um, sleep, and also uh, the extent to which they self-reported pain and their compliance with the procedures in the study and so on. So they took a number of measures on these teens. But again, they measured them before, did the massage, measured them after, okay? And they report that massage improved ADHD symptoms and other measures in these teenagers. They then go on to talk about this indicates that massage could be a useful intervention for teens. Well, hold on a second. <laughs> this is a, a pretty weak design for determining whether massage helps or not. First of all, there's no randomized assignment. There's no other controls. There's no blinding of the parents to what the teens are getting because they did use parent ratings in addition to teen ratings. Uh, there's no uh, effort to use some kind of control treatment such as uh, a different kind of massage. Uh, in other words, is it contact? with the body that's resulting in these changes? Is it a placebo effect? Is it simply expectations on the part of the patient? There's no way of controlling for any of that when you do this kind of a pre to post design. Just about any treatment that you can imagine improves people's ADHD symptoms. When you measure it before treatment, you do something after treatment. So if everybody's getting better, no matter what we do, then you can see that this design doesn't really help us discern whether the treatment actually works or not. And that's what they did here. They did the pre-post design. So we can't say much about this particular study uh, other than that it's kind of interesting. Uh, maybe the teens did get better, uh, but I'm not so sure that it was a massage. But I wanted to call your attention to it because it was picked up by several trade media outlets. Now, next up is a paper done by the researchers at the University of California, Berkeley, including my good friend, Steve Hinshaw. This is from one of the longest running and largest follow-up studies of girls from childhood to adolescence and now into adulthood. This particular paper is going to look at childhood ADHD symptoms in the girls and then look at their big five personality traits as teenagers. And of course, it's a very large study, so it involves several hundred girls, uh, and they're measuring their ADHD symptoms in childhood. And as I said, they're going to look at personality traits later. What did they find? They found that ADHD symptoms predicted lower conscientiousness, lower agreeableness, and a higher degree of neuroticism. Those are three of the five 
big five personality traits. So conscientiousness is the extent to which you are aware of your behavior and its likely consequences for you and for others. It's acting with a conscience. Agreeableness is exactly what it says. To what extent are you open to and agreeable in your interactions with others? And then neuroticism uh, really pertains more to things like uh, anxiety, uh, depression, uh, and the extent to which you might be uh, obsessive or compulsive. So they found then that girls with ADHD were lower in conscientiousness, so less concerned about their behavior and its consequences. They were less agreeable, right? and of course, they had higher rates of neuroticism. They went further to explore the links between the different kinds of ADHD symptoms, and they found that it was inattention that was related to agree, excuse me, to conscientiousness. Childhood hyperactive impulsive behavior was related to agreeableness, but neither set of symptoms was specifically predictive of neuroticism. They also found that the higher the social class of the girl in childhood and adolescence, the more negative were the effects of their ADHD symptoms on their self-descriptions of their own personalities. And the authors believe that this more pronounced effect may have to do with greater familial pressure within these high-achieving families for the teens to be high achievers as well. So uh, a very interesting study on ADHD and personality in girls. Okay, let's move along and take a look at a meta-analysis published in the Asian Journal of Psychiatry uh, that is a review of the literature of all studies of depression in mothers and the risk of ADHD in their offspring. So they're looking at mothers with perinatal depression and risk of ADHD symptoms in the offspring. And what did they find? They found 21 studies that had examined this with nearly 800,000 mother-offspring pairs involved in all of the research. Their meta-analysis showed there was a 67% increase in the risk of ADHD symptoms in the offspring of the mothers who had depression before the pregnancy and about a 53% risk in the increase in ADHD symptoms in mothers who had depression after the pregnancy, postnatal depression. So both uh, forms of depression clearly linked to an elevation in risk of ADHD symptoms. Pay attention to that, by the way. They're not talking about clinical diagnosis, just a rise in ADHD symptoms per se. Now, can you spot what's wrong with this study? Because we've talked about this before. Mothers who are depressed are more likely to have ADHD symptoms in their children. What's not being controlled here? Well, if you're a long-term subscriber to this channel, you know that it's the mother's ADHD was not assessed. And we know that mothers, women with ADHD, have higher rates of depression. So it may not be the depression at all that's the actual risk factor here. It's that the depression is simply a marker that the mother probably has ADHD also, and it's the mother's ADHD that's elevating this risk of depression. Once again, we've talked before about genetically informed designs. If you're gonna look at parent characteristics and how they relate to risk of ADHD in offspring, you've got to assess for ADHD and its genetics in the parents and control for that before rendering any conclusions about any other factors you might be studying in that research article. So they did not do that here, which means that we don't know if depression is really a good predictor of risk or if it's simply a marker for mother's ADHD. Okay, our last paper is an interesting one to me because I'm periodically receiving emails from people about whether or not there is genetic testing for determining ADHD and especially determining drug responses in people with ADHD. So here's a study that actually looked at that. It's gonna look at two different genes 
in ADHD teenagers, nearly 200 of them, by the way, and they're going to look at the response to both methylphenidate and adamoxetine, which you probably know as Stratera. And what did they find? They found that the CYP2D6 gene did seem to have some influence on the dose response timing. That is that the gene influenced both methylphenidate and adamoxetine in determining the time course of the drug. So, but it was just a trend. It wasn't statistically significant, especially for adamoxetine and barely for methylphenidate. So the authors report it's a trend. We can't say much about that here, uh, but it was kind of an interesting finding nonetheless. They did find that the second gene, which is the DAT1 gene, did seem to have some effect on increasing response to adamoxetine, depending upon which gene you got. Now, the DAT1 gene is related to dopamine transport in the brain. It seems to influence how many of the transport reuptake mechanisms there are in the brain. If you have too many, you take up dopamine too quickly, and so you're kind of in a hyper, or excuse me, hypo-dopaminergic state. Uh, on the other hand, if you have too little of these transporters, more dopamine might stay out of the nerve cell to do its job. Well, they found that people with the 910 genotype for DAT1, meaning they had one gene with nine copies and another gene with 10 copies of the sequence of the gene, they had the most rapid dose response to adamoxetine compared to the other two genotypes, which were the 10 10 and the 99 genotypes. By the way, the DAT1 gene has been found in previous research to be related not only to risk for ADHD, but also risk for some other outcomes, such as smoking, among others. So the authors conclude that their data show that while there might be a small relationship of certain genes to drug response, it's not very strong it's not especially reliable. And at this time, it means that we can't use genes, specifically these genes, to determine drug response as yet. Uh, now, there are other genes that people have looked at as well. Some of them have been found to predict drug response, but other studies have found that studying the same genes, they weren't related to drug response. So the results are quite unreliable in the literature. So my answer to you, if you're going to ask me, is genetic testing helpful for determining drug response? The answer appears to be right now, probably not. Maybe later in the future as better research is done, but we don't have genetic testing at this point that can reliably diagnose ADHD or reliably predict response to particular drugs. All right, that's it for this week, everybody. Thanks for joining me. As always, if you're not a subscriber, think about subscribing. Uh, if you are, thank you for subscribing to this channel and for tuning into this video. And please consider recommending the channel to others if you think they might have a need for this information. So as always, when I sign off, live well, be well, and take care. Bye for now, everybody.